This is Alexa Linton, and you're listening to The Whole Horse Podcast. We're now in season six. Thanks to all of you tuning in and sharing the podcast with your friends to keep the momentum going. This podcast is dedicated to all things horse and all things that uplift equine well-being and welfare. And I'm having down-to-earth conversations with equine professionals about the little things that move the dial slowly but surely towards a better world for horses. You'll find all the episodes, 93 and counting now, on iTunes, Spotify, and wherever you get your podcast. Thanks for being here and enjoy the ride. Hello and welcome back to the Whole Horse Podcast. It's Alexa Linton here and excited to be with you for this new season and excited to be introducing you to my next guest, a new guest on the podcast. We have Claire Marshall here from Plateau Holistic Equine and Claire is uh, we've had this little chat before the podcast and I'm already super fascinated. She's an archaeologist turned saddle fitter. So Claire, welcome to the podcast and thank, thank you for you. being here. <laughs> thank you for having me. I really appreciate it. <laughs> oh, it's lovely to have you. I've seen, of course, uh, some of your work through Lockie Phillips and have been sort of watching from a distance as he sings your praises and shares about some of his experiences of your work. And I would love to hear yeah. in your own words, what is it that you do? It sounds like such a fascinating combination of of knowledge that's coming together um, yeah. in this career. Yeah. Yeah. So um, just a bit of background information, really. Um, I came to horses as a hobby and a passion when I was 11. I had a, a riding lesson for my 11th birthday and then and pretty much after that I was hooked. Um, it wasn't until, you know, I, I never ever envisaged, envisaged that I would ever have a career with horses. It was something that kind of came to me by accident. It wasn't planned. Um, it, was, it was a kind of progression of a lot of left field interests. And, um, you know, you know, the, traditionally the equine industry has, you know, it's kind of so, so the amount of work for very, very little reward <laughs> in terms of kind of financial reward. And it's always about the passion. But I think everything that I've ever done is, you know, it's, there's never really been a monetary reward that's been kind of at the forefront of what I've done anyway. But um, I came to this, actually, to this work um, as a result of my work, actually, in archaeology, in research archaeology and um, writing and uh, doing, um, you know, the academic circuit, but, but primarily as part of archaeological education, because um, we used to do history on horseback. Um, so the horse in history was a big part of what we did. Mm. Um, and we would do living history displays. Uh, so everything from Iron Age Europe, because we, you know, were <clears throat> that, that was based in the UK. So we were doing the Iron Age, Roman, Anglo-Saxon. And then um, and I also did um, the, the English Civil War, which is the um, mid 17th century time period. And it was really... The fascination with the saddles, uh, the, the way of training the horse for war initially, um, and, and you know, this kind of combination of bringing the two together. And then I decided um, to kind of make a shift, a transition from doing um, pure archaeology into the, you know, cr creating a business around the education side of it. And that's led to us doing work for museums on replicating archaeological examples of saddles. Um, and then I, I, it, it kind of took me to the whole idea of uh, the Baroque saddle and or, or the, the, the saddles which we now refer to as Iberian saddles, so saddles for Spanish or Portuguese horses, because those traditional saddles have, have changed very little since 
uh, the bullfighting saddles of the 17th century, the 18th century, and also the Relvash saddle, which is a precursor to the modern dressage saddle, which was invented by a minor aristocrat from the Alentejo in Portugal in around about 1890. So there's, there's a lot of kind of connections between the training the horse and the type of equipment that was used, which really fascinated me. Mm-hmm. And as a result of that, I, I was doing a lot of work on, you know, trying to get the, the, the materials, the shapes right, but also for people who wanted to use them. So that then took me to, you know, the biomechanics of the horse and how that fits into making something for the historical reenactor, but with a basis of, you know, sound design which would help the horse make sure the horse moved correctly because not all saddles in the past were particularly well designed and of course they did have an understanding of anatomy because we can go back as far as xenophon and you know this is this is um a a, a treatise which was written uh during the ancient greek period and we talk about the training and the care of the horses Mm -hmm. even back then so they knew and understood about you know more than what what I think somebody who isn't an archaeologist or isn't a horse person would give them credit for if that makes sense but yeah that's where I came to but now it's kind of really evolved into something very very different from the early days Um, but I did come from this from a very very different angle to a lot of other people who come into the to the equine industry but as somebody who is so passionate about cross-curricular or interdisciplinary collaboration, I think it's really important that these people are allowed, you know, people from other sectors are given a platform to be able to kind of feed into the conversation and feed into the research, into things like saddle design, um, the relationship, the, the, the interaction between the rider and the horse, for example, you know, but I can get into that a little bit later, but I mean, that's kind of just looking at my, where I was coming from, where I was, you know, starting out from, but that was my story. <laughs> it's a little bit long winded, but it's, you know, it's, it's, uh, I, I, I appreciate that, that what I've learned and what I can bring to it from a history perspective does have a bearing on what we are doing today because the thing is is design concepts come in cycles as well so things is things have been done before and then we can say well actually this has been done in 1895 and here is the patent for it in the journal of harness makers or something um but we seek to obviously we can use new materials and refine things but yeah that's where i was coming from was i think the history perspective is really really important I find that so fascinating, uh, you know, in terms of a few things. I mean, me being in North America, um, typically we have kind of two types of style, right? Yeah. Our English and our Western and then variations between the two. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think that, yes, we've lost the 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 roots of that where where mm-hmm. did these designs come from why are they done this way how do they interact yeah. with the body of the horse in positive or maybe not so positive ways of course right yeah. so in your research have you found like the holy grail have you found like this is the saddle <laughs> that does it all or is it more not. <laughs> a sense of like you know, lots of different things that work for different horses. Yeah. So, so there were, the, the, there is, the, the, if you go back in history, if you go back into, you look at um, saddles from, and I'm going to go way, way, way back. I'm going to go to the dawn of, you know, not the dawn of time, but <laughs> um, of, of our, the archaeological evidence evidence that we can draw on um and I'm going to use Britain as a as an example because that's where the majority of my archaeological work was done although I have you know I did look at some when we we chatted very briefly before about me being in Canada many many years ago and you know I was talking to Indigenous people to First Nations people in Canada about horse culture and about the type of saddles that they would be using but I'm going to use just examples from Britain. Um, and we have examples from the early Roman period. Um, and they are just fragments. They're just very, very small fragments. And they are covers. So there's a, they are, there's a leather cover. 
uh, which was found in Carlisle, which is in the north of England. And it's right on, you, you might have heard of Hadrian's Wall, which is that Roman wall that goes from coast to coast, about 83 miles long, I think it is. And um, up in Carlisle, which was one of the main Roman settlements, there was a, uh, a leather cover that was found and a few pieces of the bro uh, bronze that, that sits on the outside of them. And we see there's a few of these examples um, but they are like a what they call a four horn saddle. So it's it almost looks like a pack saddle. And you could, if you're looking at Roman tombstones, for example, you will be able to see examples of these saddles. And they'll have a, 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 like a horn on each corner, like a mm -hmm. small horn. Um, and they didn't have any stirrups. Uh, we don't see stirrups in the archaeological record until about the sixth century in Europe. We see them slightly earlier in the Far East, but you don't see them in Western Europe until about the sixth century. We call that the migration period when Saxons are, when, when you see a culture changing ever so slightly and interacting with the with the, the British, the Brit Romano, called the Romano-British cultures. But you see these saddles in this context, and then you start to see a, slight, a change. So you see, um, and but they're also used as pack saddles. So you can hang things off them, you can you know take your mule or whatever. Um, but you then start to see a change. You start to see the the galleries, so we call them. So you have a front and a back gallery. So like a high fronted and a high back saddle. And you start to see that happen around about, uh, you know, the, the you get the, 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 the mid fifth century, which is when Romans withdraw administration from Britain. And um, you then start to see these variations happen. Um, and then when you come into the medieval period, you start to see big variations happen. And then you get the treaties of people like Dom Duarte the, um, um, in the 14th century in, in, in Portugal, and you see the different seats happen. So this, this, the, the styles of riding, we're talking about the styles of riding now, we're talking about the forward seat and the one where you see the, the leg right in front, for example. So the, then you start to see designs of saddle change when the riding styles change. And then if you go all the way through, I mean, I won't kind of go on and on about the different because we could be all day just talking about that one thing. But the designs of saddles tend to are, are, are down to the discipline. Uh, and that has been the case throughout history. Once you get past um, the early medieval period, you start to see. So, so for example, the, the, the saddles of the high medieval period, you have war saddles, you have saddles for games. So the joust, for example, or. Um, uh, you know, um, what they're called the get the games like um, pig sticking, hunting games that they would do at a joust, that kind of thing. So there's lots of different different applications, and then you have um, uh, you know 16th, 17th century saddles, which are you have you you start to see the school saddle come in in around about the mid 17th century, um, when you get people like um, the Duke of uh, Newcastle, um, Cavendish, at uh, places like Bowser Castle in central England, where the riding house has been restored and they do um, uh, uh, sh displays these days with replicas of those 17th century schooling saddles. So the saddles that you see today in Portuguese traditions uh, or in, for example, the Spanish riding school of Vienna will use a, a derivative of what is essentially the 17th and early 18th century schooling saddles, you see. So it, it, you start to see disciplines kind of honed down after about the 18th century, and then you get a load of different types. You've got the, you know, the plantation saddles, for example, which look more like a, uh, a cross between a modern endurance saddle and a, um, and a, and a McClellan um uh, military saddle for example so so you start to see from around about the mid 18th century onwards you start to see kind of really um kind of micro discipline changes in terms of saddle so that's kind of in a nutshell that's the time <laughs> that we were that we're working on but in, in answering your original question about have we found the perfect saddle the answer is absolutely not because you know even back then, there are certain um, treaties or there are certain bits of text that we can draw on, which tell us that actually 
um, there were certain people who were making comments about having a, a saddle for a particular horse. Uh, Caligula, for example, the the, the well, the the Roman emperor um, wrote about his favorite horse and him having a specific saddle for his favorite horse. Hmm. You know, so so there are these um, these pockets of information that we can glean, which 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 suggest to us that actually no, even back then they realized that you know the their horses um, were really important, and you couldn't just put any saddle on each of these horses does that make sense (laughs) yeah yeah Yeah, absolutely and and I I think you know that's what I've found as well as you know every horse is so unique how they move how they're built all these things are and and the rider being unique as well Mm -hmm. and and I know for myself being an equine sport therapist it's it's very common for me to hear Mm -hmm. the woes around saddle fitting from my clients I yeah. think this might be the most frustrating you know, or one of the most frustrating things that we encounter when it comes to horses and riders and finding this like mm-hmm. this thing. <laughs> this, of course. You know, that- yeah. The Holy, the Holy Grail doesn't really exist. And and one of the things that I say to, to my clients or to, to people who approach me for help and a lot of people have already exhausted their their local professional or they have you know some reoccurring issue that keeps coming up a lot and and i and i always say to people about the importance of having a good team and having a good team that will um talk to each other you know um i think traditionally you know and, and, and I can only really say this doesn't really happen so much when I because I work in Spain and I work in the UK and I work in Portugal to a certain extent. And I found there is a difference in the between the UK and probably a lot of other areas in Europe that there is a more of a willingness um, for those in Europe to collaborate. And I'm, I am making a a huge generalization here and I know that some people will say well hang on a minute you know you can't say that but um what I found with the saddlery industry in Britain is that there is a kind of everyone's fighting for their own little corner and you know you will ask 10 people 10 professionals and you'll get 10 different opinions and and I think one of the really important aspects of what we do is that we talk to the other professionals who are involved in that person's team, whoever they may be, their vet, their body worker, their, you know, their rider, um, their rider trainer, um, so off horse trainer, but some people do, some people don't obviously have people who, um, you know, work with them with their either equipilates or whatever. But I think it's really important that we, we approach it from looking at the horse from the hoof up almost. Initial assessments really, for me, are about finding out the history, looking at the horse from my perspective of where the muscle structure is at that point. And, you know, I would say about 30 to possibly sometimes even 40 percent of the horses that I initially see, I say I can't fit a saddle. And this is kind of this is down the, 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 the vexed questions, really, of should we fit a saddle at that point? And when we see the horse move and they're incredibly asymmetrical, um, and yes, of course, some of it is down to breeding, uh, hypermobility in the, in the soft tissue, in the, in the connective tissue. Um, but most of these horses, and I'm, you know, more than 95% of them, if they went away and did a good program of groundwork mm-hmm. and had a good body worker, a good vet, a good body worker for them, for them, for the riders, linking into what you do. And also, uh, because what I tend to do now is I will I will signpost more often than not people to somebody who deals with um, uh, this kind of new buzzword is called, you know, neuromechanics. So looking at how their nervous systems are affecting their movements on the horse as well. So we get into some kind of more of an esoteric thing, but what we're finding now is that this is, 
going a, a really long way to helping them sort the saddle fit out because they are, you know, for example, they might have vestibular nervous system problems. They might have their vision in one eye is, is massively out. So, of course, when you're riding a circle and you're turning more one way than the other to see where you're going, you're blocking your horse one way or the other. So we're, what we're trying to do is to employ some science of motion principles into, into assessing the rider as well as the horse. And, and I would say that about 30% of the horses that I see, sometimes even 40%, I will say to them, I'm not going to fit a saddle for you now. I'm going to send you away to have the horse checked. And I want you to, I will signpost the individual to professionals then to get themselves aligned a bit more. Because from what we'll tend to look at is do an, an off the horse assessment where we'll sit them on a book put a symmetry jacket on and say, okay, well, yeah, I think there is some, there's stuff going on here. And, and if your horse can't, if your horse is having trouble turning that way, I don't necessarily think it's a saddling issue. It could be down to you as a rider, but obviously you have to be very, very diplomatic in these circumstances. Um, but I think by the, by the time somebody has come to me or some of the, the other fitters who do work in the same way that I do, they're really on board with these concepts anyway. So having the conversation with them is a really useful exercise, mm. you know? <laughs> oh, absolutely. Yes, I do know. <laughs> I I have riders come in all the time for osteopathy course, yeah. and <laughs> without a doubt, I mean, our their intake forms are forever long. I mean, every rider has either mm -hmm. fallen off, been stepped on, you know, um, fallen onto their tailbone, yeah. had other issues happen, much less other things outside of riding occurring. Um, and it's so yeah. common that there's just a, just a, a bundle of stuff that we need need to work with that would would have yeah. very much impacted their alignment in the saddle, their mobility in the saddle their functionality so yeah yeah that that makes so much sense to bring that whole team mm -hmm. together and work with that because otherwise what are you fitting exactly and it's the it's it's actually identified i think more the more that i've d studied now about the interactions between the rider and the horse and the forces the dynamic forces that are at play because what we're trying to do when we're fitting a saddle, we want a rider to sit in a neutral pelvis so they can be the best version of themselves in the saddle. So they're not constantly fighting. And I might get kind of kicked into the long grass for saying this, but what I find with the majority of modern saddles. So if we go back to the history side of it, the English saddle was um, uh, you start to see the English saddle as we know it today in around about the 1790s. Um, and throughout and 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 the the I know a lot of Western riders tend to call them the the the, the, the help you fall out of the side window saddle. That's what, you know, um, but they um, they were historically these saddles were much better balanced than we see them today, hmm. um, and they were flatter in the seat which also meant that they were flatter in the rail of the saddle. Now, for any of your um, uh, listeners who are not familiar with these terms, well, these are parts of the tree. Um, so we have, the, we have the, the pommel or the head plate of the tree with the points. Traditionally, we have bars or rails that run down it, and then we have an acanthal. So it's a kind of almost like this shape, mm -hmm. um, you know, that, that kind of oval-ish shape with a kind of flat bit at the front to put it really crudely um the what we find these days is that the seats are often in a rear balance and this has massive implications for the neutral the the neutral part of the rider's pelvis um it also means that what we tend to see with these saddles is you get horse horses with suspensory issues that come from a problem in the lower back in T18 and the lumbar spine. Um, so we try and, well, I, I'm, I would class myself as an independent person. I would, you know, I, I deal with, 
I think five different makers I are my go-to makers. And between those, there's usually something that we can, you know, do for somebody. Um, the having a rear balance saddle over time causes the rider to sit in that chair position with the leg out front. As a result of that, over time, it creates in fact, it, you wouldn't think of it, but it, what my observations is that that can create lordosis for the rider, um, but also problems with the upper body. So, you know, uh, where they have issues in uh, around the scapula and, and lack of strength there causes the body to collapse forwards. We find that the, um, the seat itself, putting them into a forward balance or a, at least a neutral balance, has massive changes for the positive for, for riders. And, um, but yeah, most saddles, over 95% of saddles these days are made with what we would call a rear balance. So if you were to put a cotton reel and roll it into the middle of the saddle, you would see that it would sit naturally in the back third. Mm -hmm. Does this make sense, yep. what I'm, what I'm yep. saying about this? So historically, saddles were much flatter. So you could get a forward balance in the saddle much easier. Um, of course, yet yeah, spine channels were different. Now we we know that we need to leave extra space for us for English saddles because of the weight bearing support area in an English saddle is less than say a baroque or seventeenth century schooling saddle or or something with wider flatter panels, such as a you know a Western saddle has much wider flatter panels in them. But yeah, the balance of the saddles historically were much more forward, a flatter seat better for the horse's back because of course when the horse lifts if we want to kind of if we want to have that stretch that genuine stretch in the neck to be able to facilitate that the thoracic sling of the horse at the front needs to come up and of course when it comes up the whole area around the thoracic trapezius if it's in a, a comfortable position it expands and flattens out mm -hmm. so being able to accommodate the rider and all of the different pelvic shapes of riders, the rotation of their, you know, the hip rotation, how much mobility do they and flexibility do they have in their in their hips, um, getting them sitting on their seat triangle properly. There's all of these variables that we now understand, which means that really we need to be personalizing how we shape the seat so the foam in the seat of the saddle needs to be shaped according to the rider's pelvis you know and and that's why when you talk to riders about their needs and you know I know it's it's, it's most likely the same in Canada as it is in in Europe or in the US is that oh well I'll be okay just make sure the horse is fine and, and I think from your perspective, as a, a human bodywork professional, that, you know, getting that 50-50 balance is absolutely key to making sure that the rider is, you know, the best version of themselves as well. Oh, yeah. You, you say this to a girl that rode for years in a Western Wade saddle that was like a 17.5 inch wow. seat. And I'm tiny, like I'm a like That's a little a big person. Old seat for a Western. Saddle. I should have had like yeah. a maybe a 15, and I was like, but I love okay. the saddle, right? So I I get it. That happens yeah. all the time here, right? Where people are like, I'll just make it work, and that shift in thinking of like, no, we gotta we gotta find that that right fit for everyone. I have a burning question, yeah. Claire, around because you were ch chatting okay. about different pelvises and fitting different pelvises. Yeah. I would love to know the history of, I'm assuming, but this may not be true, that many saddles are based off a male pelvis. Is that, is there merit in that? So the, we, we've kind of gotten into this whole female male pelvis debate yeah. recently. And I think that's been a kind of, it's been a kind of research hot potato between various researchers. Um, and the interesting aspect of that is, is that whilst obviously female pelvises have a birth canal, <laughs> male pelvises don't, um, the actual 
interesting part of it. It comes out of some research from Cell Royale, the bike seat makers for, for, for push bikes, for bicycles. And they did some work on, uh, they did some research on pelvic imprint shapes. So mm-hmm. we're not talking about the flesh. We're not talking about the soft tissue. We're actually talking about doing the imprint of the, of the, of the, the contact point. So, you know, yep. your triangle, if you like. Um, and they their research found a huge overlap between male and female um, seat awesome. bones and the balance in the seat. And this is now going some way more to inform that kind of work um, about creating different shapes in the in the foam of the seat because as a as you might know when you're producing an English saddle you have your tree you it's strained into shape depending on you know this is a traditional traditional saddle um strained into shape and then there's some foam that's put over the top and then the leather is blocked over the top that's the very mm-hmm. that's the a very simplistic you know um, uh, explanation of it but what I think that research has done has kind of generalized. Uh, so, so previously, before Cell, with the, the work by Cell Royale came out, um, and other researchers who were looking at. Um, so, primarily, um, one of the leading researchers in looking at individualized pelvic shapes in saddles is Maria Halring in in Sweden. Mm. Um, um, she her her uh, uh, company is called Ergo X Two Saddles, and it's uh, it's also a company that I've been doing some training with myself. That we can kind of get this. I wouldn't say the holy grail of fitting the female pelvis because obviously the research is ongoing all the time. There's new stuff that's coming out all the time, but Maria's work for me has been some of the most pertinent in bringing together different professionals. Um, and looking at different ways of assessing each individual rider for for, for a new saddle. Um, so that's, uh, I mean, we could probably put some links in um, if, if this is yeah. going out, we, you know, we can put some links up to some of that research as well. And also to the work that Maria's doing, which is qu- quite groundbreaking because she's actually spent over 25 years doing this work. So she has um, uh, imprints of the, the seat triangles of thousands of riders um uh, male and female um more women than men but the the actual shapes um don't really there isn't really a marked difference Mm. between male and female but there is an overlap I think it's a someone will correct me if I'm wrong and I don't have the figures entirely to hand but I think it's about a 15 mil difference and that's it between the widths of the, the male and female pelvises but like I said I'm, I'm kind of pulling it out of my head but it isn't a lot it's not it's not like you know some other manufacturers might say oh well we, you know this is just for women and and I think that's we can't oversimplify that I think there is massive variability between men and women and it's it's um we have to take everyone on their own merit but this has to be done all also with doing things like strength tests, um, you know, simple drills and exercises to see where, where the riders are stronger and weaker, because that will feed into this whole idea of, you know, the science of motion, the forces acting on each other, uh, what Jean-Luc Corneal talks about in his science of motion work. Um, so I think, but, but I think history has a lot to, to tell us as well. You know, because um, I think if we bring together designs from the past and looking at, you know, what we're doing now with things like material science, uh, the new science of motion, um, looking at, you know, gait analysis of the horses and how that relates back to how the riders react to asymmetries in the horse as well. And I think that's a really important area of of how we should approach saddle fitting as well. Mm. So for me as we share I shared before the podcast I had as an equine sport therapist some uh, saddle fitting education ish and it was quite rudimentary as compared to any of this Mm -hmm. one of the things that I do Mm -hmm. have curiosity around I totally 
um, love that you highlighted the need for that thoracic sling to lift and flatten and, and to work properly. Mm -hmm. I think that's so critical um, for so many horses. Mm -hmm. The other thing that we of course learned about was bridging and this sense of you can't have bridging and you like, like, you know, became this, this real thing. We even like made these shims and it was this whole thing of trying to create a saddle that didn't bridge what is your yeah yeah what's your opinion on bridging I think um it's one of those things that people can get a little bit over uh a bit obsessive about yeah um but again it's down to the correct panel and tree design for the horse Um, What we often find with saddles that are made by companies that are run by people who are primarily what we call, you know, your your listeners and viewers will probably be um, familiar with the Society of Master Saddlers in in the UK, which is kind of like the benchmark for the qualification that you get as a a saddle fitter. A a QSF is the Qualified Saddle Fitter Pathway, which is done as part of the Society of Master Saddlers. But there are, obviously there are other (laughs) pathways you can take, but what I find is, is the way that saddles are balanced um, in relation to the shape of each horse's back is massively influenced by the shape of the panels as well. Um, in terms of when we get saddles that have seams on them and very large, what we call gusset seams at the back. Mm -hmm. So you've got a lot of packing and padding into the back of the saddle. When you've then got a horse that might naturally be a little bit croup high, have quite a flat wide wither, you know, lots Mm -hmm. of substance in the thoracic trapezius part of the, the muscle, um, and you have all this this panel, which is just too much. And I was told by a saddler once, and because I, you know, I spent time, a lot of time, um, shadowing different saddles, and I still do it now. Um, you know, I've been doing this job for ten years, and I still do this now. I'll go out and I will say, look, I want your perspective. I want to see how you do things because I think, you know, it's an awful saying, but more than ten ways of one way of skinning a cat, and <laughs> and it's um. um I I was told by a saddler once that if your tree is balanced and you it fits the horse because we always work on the tree first so the tree has to fit the horse you should only need uh, I'm going to I'm going to use imperial because that's what he told me and I and I'm kind of switching between imperial and metric measurements in saddle fitting that's what you have to do especially when you're working with european um, mm-hmm. you know European brands who just work in metric but he said an inch and a quarter of panel all the way around if you're if you're if your tree is balanced and it's strained properly and your seat the the, the part of the seat which the, the rider sits in you shouldn't need all of this padding at the back you know you, you should it's there to support the tree and that's it and and I kind of took that and I went away and I thought, okay, because, you know, you're taught one way and then somebody else comes along and completely blows all of that out of the water. And you're like, wow, you know, I wish I'd spoken to you five years ago. <laughs> um, but I think there's there's some truth in that, because if we look at the old hunting saddles of the early 20th century, for example, you would have a fairly forward balance for the rider so the rider can get up and out of the saddle mm-hmm. and not be fighting to stay in balance in a light or forward seat off the horse okay and you had literally just the the packing and this is a time where we would have what's called a surge panel so that fabric panel on the underneath rather than the leather that you get in most kind of mass produced saddles today or most saddles anyway and you'd it usually be stuffed with horse hair and it's a very it was literally like an inch and a quarter all the way around and because it had a flattish rail at the front, just underneath the stirrup bars, um, it just, you could genuinely put these saddles on more horses. But because you didn't have this massive um, panel at the back, it swept upwards. I mean, you get things like Harry Dabbs call it a performance panel. Um, I think you have Harry Dabbs in it, 
I don't know. Over, yeah. over there, don't you? Probably. Desk paddles. Mm -hmm. You have what's called, they call them a performance paddle, prestige do it, where the panel sweeps up into the into the back of the cantor uh, uh, um, underneath. And, um, but those have been around since the very first English saddles were ever made. Um, and what we find with those is when we put those on horses, there's less chance of it bridging than if you put it with a large, a large panel at the back. And mm -hmm. large panels really are only there if you've got a horse with an incredibly high wither and you want to balance the back of the saddle up and keep the rider in the middle rather than the rider being tipped to the towards the back of the saddle. But one of the things that I do when I'm when I'm working on saddles and I'm, you know, I'm, I'm, I've got the width right or whatever, is I don't pack the front and the back. I concentrate my work on the middle of the saddle, mm -hmm. saddle from just behind the points, just in front of the stirrup bar and grade it off to around about the point. So what I'll do is I'll get the rider to, to stand in the st stirrups and then sit down as if they're just going into a, a, a rising trot. So it's a posting, they'll sit down. And then where their seat bone falls, I will flock out to that point. So we negate any of this uh, bridging. I mean, you know, bridging can happen for a number of reasons as well. I mean, if the horse is, is in a lot of pain and they are moving their body away from an area of pain, they will naturally bridge there anyway. Mm -hmm. um, but I work on the middle of the saddle. So I, I, unless the saddle is horrendously long for the horse um, and we've got those big panels at the back, bridging really isn't an issue. And one of the things that I found as well is, you know, not by putting the, the, the flocking in right in the front of the saddle, but actually working, you know, on that part um, where it's supposed to be supporting the thoracic trapezius properly. If we work there, obviously within reason, because we don't want to pack it in and cause blocking in that area, because it's really important when we were talking about the thoracic sling and the lift. But I found that if we if we give that support there, it brings it off the front. So mm -hmm. it naturally allows for that shoulder, to, the scapula to slide under. And it actually brings the rider into a better balance. I mean, I, this is it's very. Again, I'm probably explaining this fairly simplistically. And of course, we have to do this according to the to the movement of the horse. But I found that actually concentrating on this area, and making sure that the flocking is absolutely right there. Mm -hmm. first before I go to flock any other part of the saddle and grading it properly so that it supports the rider in that optimum position then we don't have to do a lot more with the saddle after that um, and that again is one of the principles that we've learned I mean I was doing this before but I think it kind of affirmed what I was doing when when, when I was talking to Maria Hullring about this and about their, how their saddles are, are made mm -hmm. and and it's it's a really interesting um, where you know the dynamic of it and how it sits the rider then in in a better position I found it it really helped me to uh, with these horses that generally have really real problems with anything touching their shoulder their scapulas because you know we get uh, that need that open head or whatever you, you know yes some of them do need it but not all horses need that massively open head on a, on a tree um so that very u-shaped head that you mm. might well have seen mm. on um on certain brands on certain mates of saddles but yeah i found that concentrating on that area that we talked about in terms of the thoracic sling the lift taking templates of the static and the uh, before and after working so we know how much expansion that muscle has through you know whether when there's blood's flowing to the muscles um, and extrapolating the difference between that. And, and I think that's a really good starting point to avoid bridging in your saddles mm. as well. Mm. Well, that's <laughs> it's a bit long-winded dance. A bit, no, you know. that's it's, it's so it's, helpful. Um, it, and it brings up a million other questions for me. I have a, a potentially controversial question that I want to ask from a personal okay. space um, yeah. around the treeless saddle. Yeah, da, da, da. and what you know, what your opinion is of? I mean, there, I know there's lots of brands of treeless saddles, and probably some do it better than others. Uh, I ride in a treeless saddle, mm -hmm. and 
just wondering, you know, we don't have that structure. It definitely changes the way that the saddle is, you know, supporting spinal clearance, all these things. What is your sense Mm of working with a treeless saddle? So I don't have, I'm not dogmatic about people using certain things Mm -hmm. over others. Um, For me, the, the key thing is to have the right equipment for the right situation. So in my experience, I have, and I know this is going to be quite a controversial answer actually as well. Um, I, I see people in treeless saddles and I see um, people using treeless saddles inappropriately because they are simply not balanced enough to actually allow for the stability in the saddle to stay there. I think they have their applications. Um, I, you know, I I do the the Christ Lanfell bareback pads, for example, mm-hmm. the, which I think are fantastic. Um, what I say, and I and I know of several riders who are doing, you know, high school classical dressage with bareback pads. Um, and I think this brings us to a potentially controversial area where riders are concerned. And that's with riders who are a bit too heavy for their horses. Um, So looking at the 15% of of body weight, um, the the, the body weight for horses index and how there is a potential for micro temporary lameness to come in when you're riding, when you have a rider who is over that. I mean, of course, it's, it's different between breeds and it's different between fitness levels, but this is this kind of arbitrary cutoff point that, are, that that is informing a lot of decisions at shows or at, you know, riding schools or whatever. Um, I think in the right hands, I think they are an incredible tool. Um, I think there is a lot, there are a lot of really bad designs out there, but there are a lot of really bad designs of all saddles. Mm-hmm. Um, so I'm not, I would never single out the, the treeless saddle. I work with flex tree saddles. Um, so th- th- there's a, a couple of different makers that I really like who do flex tree saddles. Um, so either they are made using uh, a rail with birch ply and leather laminate, which mm-hmm. was uh, pioneered by, by Passier in the 70s. Um, or they they will do what's called an articulated or broken tree saddle, as the Portuguese called it, where they would put cuts in it. It cuts in the rail of the tree and they bind it with rawhide so it makes a flexible uh but they have they have a fairly limited lifespan those that particular mm-hmm. type of tree of between five and seven years and then you start getting twisting and, and whatnot in them um so i i love the idea of a saddle that can move with the horse um assuming that the horse isn't horrendously asymmetrical, but going back to what we were saying at that point, I would say, get off the horse, do a groundwork program with a trusted trainer, go and see a body worker and do all of that first. But um, I think the, the treeless thing, what I have seen with some treeless, I think the only time that I wouldn't recommend prolonged use of a treeless is if you have an unbalanced rider who is spending hours and hours and hours on trails like this mm-hmm. and doing some incredibly tricky, difficult work on some really difficult trails. And I think that's when I tend to say, maybe look at a well-fitted tree saddle or a flex tree saddle in that instance. But, you know, I know a lot of people who are schooling perfectly well in treeless saddles as well so yeah I don't I don't have I'm not I'm not one of these people that would dogmatically say don't use one I mean awesome. that they're all the devil's work at all so you know <laughs> that's amazing so we're going back tools for the job and if the tool if the tool works and it, it it's not broken then don't fix it yeah you know I I uh I've ridden in uh, I always say the name wrong but fit fit fit, fit settle bareback pad thing okay um which is a more foamy yeah luxurious uh padded for the horse um but i i found uh that i i for my own back needed a little bit more support and my mm-hmm. my mare did as well but we yeah. kind of you know we cruise you know yeah. we yeah, we yeah. do a two-hour trail walk 
rhyme yeah, thing, yeah. Um, you know, on pretty easy stuff. Uh, so I, I totally get that sense of, yeah, you know, it's, it's do, you know, looking at the use and how, I think so. how that's impacting the horse. That, that's really helpful. I'm sure for a lot of mm-hmm. listeners as well to go, okay, you know, what, what am I doing there with that? Um, yeah. I, I have, you know, so one of the things I often see especially with, uh, well, with both English and Western here is this sense that people are using tons of pads and bumper pads and sheepskins and all the things. Um, And I would love your, your take on that. I think, see, I, I always say if somebody's kind of using a lot of padding, you are, um, you're raising your center of gravity and you're creating the conditions for instability, especially if you have an asymmetrical horse on a rider who's asymmetrical in the same way, that your saddle's just going to fly off to one side as soon as a, they get spooked by something, you know, a, a deer or something out on the trail, you know. It's, it, for me, padding, again, is very individual and it's down to the horse. And, and all, more often than not, the horse will tell me if they want more padding or not, because with the best will in the world and the your training that you do, there will always be horses that don't that don't conform to your idea of how they want their saddle fitted. Like us, you know, we like our, you know, some people like their skinny jeans and some people like their slouchy pants. So it's um, that I carry four or five different types of pads with me. Um, and what I aim to do is if I have a horse that's coming back into, into work or a young horse, mm-hmm. I want to give them some extra cushioning. Um, so either um, a, a high performance type of foam, which has a low, um, it's high density, but kind of thinner. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, some foams just have too much rebound and on wider horses, you want to be able to make sure that there's stability in there. So you don't want a foam that's gonna bounce a bit like a trampoline effect. So it's all, again, down to material science that we understand our products. But I love sheepskin and one of, and I love sheepskin um, using it to, for young horses um, and for horses coming back into work, which just gives them that extra little bit of support. Um, there are certain brands of, um, of well-designed pads that I like but I will give them a moderate amount of support, but I will change and I will try a couple of different ones. And if the horse tells me they like something over something else, then I'll say, look, you know, that's what your horse wants. So let's run with that one. And then in terms of like timescales, you know, you might want to change it at some point when your your horse has developed a little bit more muscle or strength or their shape is changing. Um, try so you know we can try something else with them to see if they prefer that at that time because it's it's not a static thing a horse can a horse can and will change its mind about what it likes or doesn't mm-hmm. like it so and and it's the same for you know for, for saddle fitting is that a horse can like something in one month and then two or three months down the line when they've changed they might prefer something else and and I think that leads us into another statement really about the length of time that we need to be looking at between fittings because you know traditionally the society of master saddlers will say that you know at a minimum you should have your saddle looked at every six months but i found with some of my clients that i'm going out every 10 to 12 weeks when the when the saddle when you know when the horse is is developing and changing shape and um yeah so and and, and I, but i i realize i get it that the in bigger countries and it's it's more difficult for people to mm-hmm. have access to a professional who can do that as well and um yeah <laughs> but but yeah um i don't recommend putting lots of pads under it because of stability issues i would prefer to recommend something to somebody at the time and that they stick with it and don't change it because that's another thing we get is people buying pads sticking them on and then saying oh my saddle doesn't fit and and i say well you know how much thicker is the pad or how much thinner is it you know are we now getting into bridging because you've put something on that's just too thick so it's putting more pressure in the front and the back and you know you've got nothing in the middle so yes Lots and lots of pads. Don't do it, guys. 
<laughs> yeah, yeah, I see it all the time, especially people bumping up the back of the saddle. And I think, okay, yeah. like, you know, this sense of this tipping. Mm-hmm. And I imagine, you know, with the thoracic sling and, and everything mm-hmm. wanted there, we get into this, yeah, a bit of a whack-a-mole game of of course someone yeah. trying to maybe solve a problem in terms of their own posture and alignment mm-hmm. and creating. Yeah. And but this goes back to what I was saying about balance in the seat and how the sh- the foam in the seat is shaped, because, like I said, most modern dresser dresser saddles mainly, but I have seen them in GP saddles as well, is that they're just sitting too far back, and then you do have to put a riser in at the back mm. to get them to sit straight again. When actually it's the it's the shape of the seat which is the problem. Um, and some saddles you will never ever unless you put a riser in the back you'll never get them neutral or in any kind of correct balance for the rider where they are sitting over their stirrup bars you know so it's a constant battle I'm afraid Um, uh, but you know people are willing you know I've I've got great clients and I I, people are willing to learn and to listen and to take on board what I say about the saddle and then we can you know we I do distance fittings and I mean, I have clients in Canada and in the U S who I have these zoom conversations with and, and I talk and I will go through, you know, marking up their pictures of their saddles and saying, look where the balance point is in there here compared to where you're sitting. And you'll never get that neutral or full, ideally a bit more forward balance because your saddle is not shaped. You'd have to take all the leather off, reshape the seat and then try again. And that's kind of putting the saddle back together. That's taking the saddle apart completely to do it. So, um, yeah, it's it's um, it's it's a it's it's a problem. Um, but I think more and more people are coming to understand that they can get balanced, um, and they don't need you know you don't need a massive a five grand saddle to do it. But there are makers out there who are making nice simple saddles. I, I always say to people, less is more. And that's with pads as well. Just less is more. And then let's start again and then just just take it from there, really. <laughs> mm, I love that. That's perfect timing because we've just we're just coming into the end of our time together today, which makes me very sad because there I feel like there's so many more questions <laughs> that are out there. To do it some point else. <laughs> we might have to do another one for sure. Yeah. Um, I so appreciate you being here, Claire. This has been really, really uh yeah content rich and and so fascinating with the historical perspective so thank you well it's been an absolute pleasure alexa i really appreciate you um giving me the opportunity to talk to your listeners about it oh you're so welcome so i want to make sure that you can tell everybody how to get in touch with you claire because i know there's going to be listeners that are like i need to get her on zoom (laughs) from over (laughs) this side and people that are close to you uh you know over over in the uk and spain so how do people get in touch so um we are um plateau holistic equine.com um, and that's just all one word, no spaces, no hyphens in there, plateauholisticequine.com. Um, Instagram is Plateau Saddlery. And Facebook, if you just put Plateau Holistic Equine in there, you'll find us on Facebook as well. Yeah, and you can get in touch via the website uh, or via social media uh, and we can have a conversation, you know. So I'll be more than happy to to engage with some of your listeners in any way I can, even if it's kind of, you know, helping out with a discovery call or a consultation and then working with, you know, fitters in in their country or in Canada or the US or whatever um, to actually help, you know, just to help them as well. So I'm all about collaboration. And I think that's super important in our sector because life is hard. <laughs> And we need all the help we can get, especially with horses. Oh, for sure. And at the end of the day, we're here for the horses. So that's where I go to with collaboration. It's like whatever Mm -hmm. can help. So yeah, this is definitely a big piece of the puzzle. So that is great for all of you out there. I hope you enjoyed. And if you are having saddle fit issues or questions, reach out to Claire and I think I might be as well. <laughs> uh, so Anytime. appreciate appreciate this conversation, Claire. And Thank thanks. You.
thanks everybody for listening in today and we'll see you next time. Bye for now. Thank you.